Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to dig deeper into the Remembrance of Earth's past trilogy and go over the timeline while taking a look at my personal favorite moments within the Common Era. Note, this gets a little tricky because the books aren't always linear. So looking at the timeline chronologically might help put things into perspective and should be a nice overview. This will of course contain spoilers for the first book of the series, Three Body Problem, as well as a bit of the prologue from The Dark Forest. If you enjoy these types of videos, let me know by liking this one, give it a share, and subscribe to the channel. So let's get into it. In the English translation of the books, the common era is kicked off by the first events we see on page, taking place during the Cultural Revolution in China. Ye Wenxia is an astrophysics graduate and witnesses her father as he is killed by red guards. Ye Wenxia is branded a traitor and is sent to the Inner Mongolia's labor brigade. These events took place roughly between 1967 to 1969. My first favorite segment of the story isn't an uplifting one, but it's really pivotal. Ye Wenxia is given a book called Silent Spring by a reporter named Bai Mu Lin and offers to transcribe an article for Bai based on the destruction of forests and the irresponsible behavior of the Mongolian Construction Corp. Reading this book and the consequences for transcribing the article have two major side effects for Ye Wenxia. Silent Spring, the book itself, is a real one that anyone can buy, and during the time of its dissemination was incredibly controversial, even in the West. The author Rachel Carson experienced intense criticism for her findings on the use of pesticides. She argued that widespread use of these chemicals was causing ecological harm, endangering wildlife, and even risking human health. The book led to the scrutiny of pesticide use and influenced a whole environmental movement and regulations against pesticides, but it wasn't an easy path for Carson. Opponents of Silent Spring attacked her personally. They accused her of being radical, disloyal, unscientific, and a quote, hysterical woman. Because in the 60s, at the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, criticism against the United States was seen by many as unpatriotic, or even worse, sympathetic with America's rivals. Despite the controversies and hardships experienced by the author, Silent Spring is credited with catalyzing environmental awareness and inspiring regulatory changes in pesticide usage. Looking over all this information, it's easy to see how this would have an impact on Ye Wenxia, and it's the perfect catalyst to set up her friendship with Mike Evans, making them allies. After reading the book, she thinks to herself, it was impossible to have a moral awakening from humankind itself, just as it was to expect humans to loft off the earth by pulling up on their own hair. To achieve moral awakening required a force outside the human race. Moving forward to the second side effect of Silent Spring, it also leads to the betrayal by Bai Mu Lin. When the book and article that she transcribed is uncovered, Ye Wenxia is accused of stealing the book and charged with obtaining intellectual weapons used for attacking socialism. This ultimately determines the choice of her life. It's one of the major turning points of humanity's history within the entire Three Body Problem trilogy. Coupled with the atrocities Ye experienced concerning her family, it's a moment that changed her deeply and gives her the reasoning to send out Earth's coordinates to the Trisolarans. Moving along to the next big moments in the Common Era, Ye Wenxia is sentenced to prison and then recruited by Yang Weining and Li Jicheng, two military physicists working at Red Coast Base. During her time working there, she climbs the ranks quickly due to her intelligence and background in academics. Ye Wenxia discovers the organization at Red Coast is actually searching for extraterrestrial life. She tests a theory by sending out a message to space using the sun's microwave cavities as an amplifier, and it works. Years later, 
she receives a warning from a pacifist Trisolaren pleading with her not to respond to the next message that is sent by their species. But she does anyways and invites aliens to Earth saying, Come here. I will help you conquer this world. Our civilization is no longer capable of solving its own problems. We need your force to intervene. Because due to everything she has experienced, Yeowensia is frustrated and disillusioned by humanity. She ends up killing her husband and colleague to keep this message a secret. The murders are treated as accidents. My next favorite movement within the Common Era takes place around the birth of Ye Wenxia's daughter, Yang Dong. At this time in the story, Ye begins to tutor some of the local children in physics so they can pass the National College entrance exam, gaining her the admiration of the poor families living in the area. There's a moment that takes place on a very cold and lonely New Year's Eve where she's feeling very depressed and a group of her young students dressed in rags make the long journey up the mountains to bring her dinner, a large pot of cabbages and pork dumplings. I have to include this moment because while it's not incredibly essential to the plot, it's a small ray of sunshine in a very dour segment of Via Wencia's life. When she goes into labor with her daughter, she loses too much blood and goes into a coma, but survives because dozens of the peasants from Jia Twen had come to donate blood to her. These were the parents and friends of the children that Yi had tutored. It's such a bittersweet part of the story, showing that there is still tenderness and unselfishness out there, but it comes too late. Because at this point in time, the fate of humanity has already been determined since the moment she sends her message into space. It's easy to feel a lot of ambivalence in this segment, not by a lack of emotions, but in a way that it's easy to feel happiness and sadness at the same time. After these events, the Cultural Revolution ends, and Ye Wenxia returns to her alma mater to teach as a professor. She later meets Mike Evans, who's both a hermit and the son of an oil CEO. Evans is a bit of an eco-friendly radical, who is also disillusioned by humanity like Yi. They form a friendship, and she tells him all about the Red Coast Base events and the message she sent into outer space. Evans, with his inheritance, buys a massive ship called Judgment Day and he turns it into a secret mobile colony and listening post. Aboard Judgment Day, the Trisolaran message confirms Ye Wenjia's story, and Mike Evans forms a group called the Earth Trisolaris Organization, or ETO, as allies for Trisolaris on Earth. They learn that the Trisolaran invasion fleet is coming, but it will take 450 years before they land. Moving forward in the timeline, we then have to look a little more at the Earth Trisolaris organization and their movement. This brings up my next favorite moment and its concept. Under Mike Evans, the ETO brings in scientists and educated politicians who, like Yawensia, are discontented with world affairs. They create their own army and nuclear weapons. What I find interesting is that the ETO is also a reflection of society in the way that it's divided. While Evans maintains control of the organization, he starts to hold back communications he has with Trisolaris, and the ETO splits into factions. The first and smallest is labeled the survivors. They plan on helping Trisolarans in exchange for their descendants to live when the rest of humanity dies upon the aliens' takeover of the planet. The next faction is called the Redemptionists, led by Shen Yufei. They are a group involved in finding a solution to the three-body problem that plagues the Trisolaran homeworld. The last group is led by Mike Evans, called the Adventists. This group is hoping for the destruction of humanity. Everyone has a basis for why they throw in their lot with the aliens, whether it be for the betterment of society, a better life for their children, personal advancement, 
or just a satisfaction and a way to put Earth in the hands of new management. The Trisolarans mean something different to each faction. To some, they are a godlike deity. To others, just a species that needs help, like an animal threatened with extinction. And to some, the hand of justice coming to right the wrongs of society. And now that the ETO is established and holding power, they still find a way to kick themselves by being petty, power-hungry, and fractured. It's a wonderful introspective look on human nature and tribalism. In the current time, nanotech professor Wang Miao teams up with a detective, Shi Quang, to investigate a string of suicides in the scientific community, including Ye Wenxia's daughter, Yang Dong. They discover a global conspiracy among governments and what looks like the threat of war. Somewhere in this time frame after the death of Yang Dong, Luo Ji, a former astronomy student and current sociology professor, meets Ye Wenxia at the grave of her daughter. Ye Wenxia encourages him to pursue both topics and become a cosmic sociologist and tells him the axioms of the subject. First, that survival is the most important need of civilization. And second, that civilization continuously grows and expands, but the total matter in the universe remains constant. Combine these two axioms and what's left is a base concept, two things of great importance to influence cosmic sociology, chains of suspicion and the technological explosion. Shortly after Wang Miao meets Da Shi, he experiences strange visions, meets up with Ye Wenxia, and stumbles upon the virtual reality game called Three Body, designed by the ETO. The game depicts a planet with erratic climate shifts between stable and chaotic eras. Now, the reason the Three Body game is so interesting is because it's not only a recruitment tool to gain sympathy for the plight of the Trisolarans, but it also works as a way for the ETO to search out the best and brightest for recruitment. During his time within the three-body game, Wang Miao proves himself worthy and is welcomed into the ETO. He learns that the Trisolarans live on a planet with three suns that have evolved to dehydrate and survive chaotic eras. Wang discovers that the distance of the suns determines stability. Colonizing Earth becomes their plan for prosperity, and their only escape as their planet faces an uncertain collision with a sun. The climax is the creation of the Sophon and the departure of the Trisolaran fleet. But what's interesting here is that this alien species has a problem. By their findings, Earth is unique. Humans took more than 100,000 years to progress from hunter-gatherers to the agricultural age, but only took 200 years to go from the industrial age to the atomic age. Earth civilization possesses the terrifying ability of accelerated technological progress. By the time Trisolarans arrive on Earth, they will be outmatched by a superior civilization. They need to come up with a solution to neuter Earth's advancement, so they come up with a two-pronged plan. Step one is to exploit the alienated forces on Earth, people like Ye Wenxia, who are discontent due to hardship. They will likely grow in numbers once the Trisolarans reveal to them that they aren't alone in the universe. The announcement itself will likely fracture Earth even further. Step two is to neuter Earth and kill its science. This will happen in multiple ways. First, use propaganda, emphasizing the negative environmental effects of science to slow development. Second, showcase the Trisolaran technology because it's so advanced that humans will see it as miracles, resulting in the worship of an alien species. This plan is called Project Sophon. The Trisolaran technology called the Sophon will act as a real-time galactic spy, informing Trisolaris of actions on Earth. Wang later informs De Shi about a meeting 
which triggers a clash between the People's Liberation Army and society's soldiers, leading to Ye Wen-sia's arrest. The PLA collaborates with American forces to ambush Mike Evans' ship, also used as the ETO's headquarters, Judgment Day, currently making its way to the Panama Canal. This next part is probably the most exciting moment of the book for me, which is called Operation Gu Chung, named after a traditional Chinese zither with sharp strings. Personally, I think this is one of the real highlights for De Shi, because now he's in a room full of military operatives with years of experience who look down on him, but he outshines them all due to his natural problem-solving skills and cleverness. The plan is simple. The transmission data between the ETO and Mike Evans needs to be recovered from the ship before they're erased. So De Shi suggests setting up pillars on each side of the Panama Canal. Next, they will use Professor Miao's nanomaterial called Flying Blade tethering it to the pillars to slice the ship into segments as it passes through the canal. De Shi also recommends that Operation Gucheng takes place during the day, because at night the crew will be sleeping, which means they'll all be laying down. 50 centimeters between filaments leaves too much a gap, but during the day, even if they're sitting or crouching, the distance is sufficient to which a UN official calls De Shi a demon. It's a moment like this in the story where you see the lengths the characters must go through to achieve saving Earth, if it takes killing everyone aboard the ship to make sure the data isn't destroyed, it's still a step worth taking. De Shi has cleverly laid out the most efficient plan, and everyone in the room is pretty awestruck. It's nothing short of genius and shows the true layers of his character. When I read this chapter, I was happily surprised that the plan is his, because in a story composed of so many wonks and brilliant scientists, De Shi is a bit of a relatable everyman and not a typical hero. This, of course, culminates to a pretty epic climax, when the plan works and the ship is sliced into segments. The last transmission Earth receives from the Trisolarans is that they are nothing, as helpless as bugs. Despite learning that Trisolaris has rendered Earth incapable of advancement with the use of the Sophon, De Shi draws the conclusion that like bugs, perhaps humans will also be impossible to eradicate. It's a profound moment, and a hopeful one that leaves room for higher stakes once we move to the crisis era. To wrap up this episode, I want to read off a quote from the author because it's always stuck with me, and that's, Science fiction often describes a day when humanity will form a harmonious whole, and I believe the arrival of such a day need not wait for the appearance of extraterrestrials. And I think it's a great thought to end the common era timeline with, because simply put, the suffering one character, Ye Wen-sia, experiences changes the future and dooms all existence on planet Earth. Had things been different and her life been a harmonious one, perhaps events would have been different. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'll be back with more three-body coverage in the future.